اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم آئی نمبر 172 الذین استجابوا لله والرسول من بعد ما اصابهم القرح Those believers who responded to Allah and the messenger after injury had struck them للذین احسنوا منهم واتقوا For those who did good among them and feared Allah is a great reward. For those people who responded to the call of Allah and the Messenger, when? After the qarh had reached them. Istajabu is from the root letters jim, waw, ba, from the word jawab. And jawab is to respond. So istajabu, they responded, they answered, they listened to, And when somebody calls you, you respond to them. What does it mean by that? That you do what they have asked you to do. So istajabu does not just mean that they responded, they answered, that somebody calls them and they say yes and that's it. No. That whatever they have been told, they actually do it. So they complied with whatever they were commanded. They listened to what they were ordered. They accepted what they were commanded. So الذين استجابوا They responded to who? Lillahi, to Allah, wal Rasul and the Messenger. Meaning to the call of Allah and the call of the Messenger. When did they respond to the call of Allah and the Messenger? Min ba'di, after. Ma that, asabahum al qarh. The qarh reached them. Asaba, from the root letter, sad wa ba. And asaba yusibu, to reach, to afflict. And al qarh, from the root letter, qaf, raha. And remember the meaning of qarh, it is used for a wound and in particular it is used for an internal injury an internal wound that is caused by an external blow and the word qarh applies to the wound the injury that a person is suffering it also applies to the pain of that wound it also applies to the pain of the wound that a person is suffering from so after the qarh reached them meaning after they were hit by a qarh what does this refer to? We learned that the Meccan army, after causing great loss to the Muslims at Uhud, what did they do? They departed. They departed. They left the Uhud and they went back towards Mecca. And we learned that they had not gone far away when the people in that army, they started complaining against one another and they began accusing their leaders of not having inflicted enough harm on the Muslims, of having withdrawn without inflicting complete harm on the Muslims. Because we learned that they killed many of the Muslims, yes. And they also injured many of them. However, they went back without taking any captives. Because typically, when an army is victorious over the other army, generally, especially at that time, the victorious ones, they would take back prisoners or captives from those whom they had defeated. Similarly, they would take a lot of booty with them. And if they wanted, they would also go to their hometown and they would go and attack the people over there because obviously there is no army to defend the people. Correct? But the Meccan army, what did they do? They just defeated the Muslims over there and they went back. They withdrew without taking any captives, without killing each and every one of them, without going on to Medina and attacking the women and children and old over there. So when this happened, halfway through, the people in the army, they started complaining that what did we do? We should not have come back. And they started accusing their leaders. So at that time, we learned that the Mushrikeen army, they started gathering up together. They started preparing to attack the Muslims again. And we see that on the other hand, the Prophet ﷺ decided the very next day, the next day after Uhud. So the Prophet ﷺ on the other hand, he decided the very next day to move out, meaning to go out in pursuit of the Meccan army. So on the one hand, the Meccan army is deciding to come back to Medina. On the other hand, the Prophet ﷺ decided that the Muslims should go in pursuit of the army. Why? Because that Mushrikeen army, the enemy, might come back and attack the Muslims. So at that time, the Prophet ﷺ, he announced that we all have to go now. And we learned that only the people who had participated at Uhud were allowed to accompany him. And 70 companions, they stood up right away. And we learned that many of them were wounded. Many of them were injured. And even if they were not injured, 
they must have been very tired they must have been exhausted and even if they weren't exhausted they suffered a defeat they suffered a great setback which obviously should have affected their confidence but despite that they all stood up and immediately they went along with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam now we learned that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he took those muslims he went with those muslims in pursuit of the mushrikeen army and we learned that they camped the muslim army they camped at hamra al asad and hamra al asad is a place that is about 13 kilometers from medina so they went about 13 kilometers in pursuit of the mushrik army and at that place at that point they met naim ibn ashjari naim ibn ashjari was not a muslim and he informed the muslims about the plan of abu sufyan and his army at hamra al asad what did naim al ashjari do he informed the muslims about the plan of who the mushrikeen of abu sufyan and his army and at that time he started scaring the muslims said look they have gathered up together they're coming to attack you you will not be able to withstand this you will not be able to withstand their attack so you should go back home you should fear them you can't defend yourself and at that time the sahaba their reaction was what did they feel weak did they say okay let's forget about it let's run away no they said hasbunallah allah is enough for us allah is sufficient for us and they stayed over there on the other hand we learn that Ma'bad Khuzari Ma'bad Khuzari he was going from Medina to Mecca Ma'bad Al-Khuzari he was going from Medina to Mecca and he was also not a muslim he was also not a muslim but he had some alliances with the muslims which is why he was sincere to the muslims so he was on his way to Mecca and he found the mushrikeen army under Abu Sufyan coming to attack the muslims when he met Abu Sufyan and his army he discouraged them from going further and he said you are deceived you think that you have defeated the muslims no you haven't defeated them they have actually set out of medina and they're coming in your pursuit they're going to come and attack you upon that abu sufyan changed his mind and he went back to makkah and his entire army also went back but in this incident we see something very amazing the reaction of the muslims they had just suffered a defeat many of them had been killed many of them had been injured many of them could not walk on their own just imagine umar mara i mentioned to you about the big wound on her shoulder so just imagine if the wounds are fresh they're still bleeding and you're still exhausted you're fatigued but at that time allah and his messenger they tell you we have to go now even if you're very tired even if you're very exhausted what was their reaction they didn't excuse themselves they didn't despite the fatigue despite the wounds what did they do hasbunallah allah is enough for us and we learned that the muslims along with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they stayed at hamra al asad for 3 days and when abu sufyan didn't come then they went back to medina and on the return to medina they came across a caravan with which they had some trade and they actually came back home with a lot of gain a lot of profit so then these ayat were revealed praising the reaction of the muslims alladhina istajabu lillah those who responded to allah wal rasul and the messenger we see over here that has been mentioned istajabu lillah they responded to allah whereas the fact is that the command was given to them by the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it was given to them by who the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave them the command there wasn't an ayah that was revealed about it so how come it has been said they responded to allah because the sahaba knew that whatever the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam commands them it is from who it is from allah any command any instruction that he gives is actually from allah and the prophet is also from allah so therefore whatever he tells us whatever he commands us if we listen if we obey who are we obeying allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and today unfortunately many of the muslims they differentiate between the command of allah and the command of the messenger they say is it in the quran if it's not in the quran it's okay no it's not okay if it's mentioned in the sunnah if the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has commanded then it's also very important 
So the ladina stajabu lillahi wal rasul, when did they respond? Min ba'di ma asabahum al qarh. After the qarh hit them. Meaning, they were physically injured. They were physically wounded. And they were also emotionally wounded. They were also suffering a lot of pain emotionally. Because many of their companions had died. Just imagine if you learned 70 of your friends have been killed. How would you feel? Just imagine. If we learn about the death of one person in our family, we feel so distraught, we feel so upset for so many days, we can't get over it. But the Sahaba, the next day, a command of Allah came, a command of the Messenger came, okay, samirna wa atarna. No matter how we're feeling, doesn't matter. It's the command of Allah, it's the command of the Messenger. And this shows that the deen was more important to them than their own lives, than their own comfort. And only when a person is committed to the deen in this way, is committed to the way of Allah in this way, then he gets the reward, then he is successful, then he can get something in his hand. And if we think it's okay, I have the reason to excuse myself, I have a reason to stay back, then... We cannot be successful. We cannot get anything in our hands. مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا أَصَابَهُمُ الْقَرْحِ لِلَّذِينَ أَحْسَنُوا مِنْهُمْ For those people who did ihsan among them. What was the ihsan? What was the ihsan that they did? That despite their wounds, despite the fatigue, despite the injury, what did they do? They responded to the call of Allah. Allah calls it ihsan. And they also وَاتَّقَوْ And they also feared. Feared who? feared Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how they feared disobeying the command of Allah it was taqwa it was a fear of Allah that made them overcome their fatigue that made them overcome the pain that they were suffering so lilladina ahsanu minhum wa taqaw ajrun azim for them is a great reward for them is a great reward what do we learn from this ayah that first of all when a person believes in Allah then what happens he is tested. There are definitely going to be tests. And sometimes these tests come one after the other. That you don't even get to take a break. Not even a break of one week. Every Monday you have a test. At least you have one week in the middle. It's not every day. Look at the Sahaba. One day they go to Uhud. The next day they set out on another expedition. Without taking any break. Unfortunately, we have this mentality that if I have studied for two hours, then I have to take a break for three hours. Then I have to take a break for five hours. This is how we think. Which is why at the end of the day, we haven't accomplished anything. If we look, our week, our month goes by without us having accomplished anything substantial. Why? Because we want to take a break. We want to take it easy. We don't want to overwork ourselves. But sometimes you see, that when a person has iman, that his iman makes him overcome the pain that he is suffering from. And sometimes you see even with you know women, that they're so tired, they're exhausted, but if their child is crying, what are they going to do? Let the baby cry? No. They're going to ignore their pain. They're going to overcome their pain. Why? Because of the love and the care that they have for their child. So similarly, when a person loves the deen, when a person is sincerely committed to the deen, then he forgets his own problems. Then he doesn't give much attention to his own problems, to his head that is hurting, or to his stomach that is growling out of hunger. No. It's the command of Allah. This is what Allah wants me to do. This is how I can get the ridwan of Allah. This is how I can get ajrun kabir. Okay. Also we learn from the ayah, that we must be very careful about how we react at a time when we are suffering from pain. When we're suffering from pain or difficulty. So for instance, if we're very tired and if we're called to pray salah, what is our reaction? Immediate reaction. Is it, oh my God? Or is it, samirna wa atarna, hasbunallah. Sometimes we're told about a huge task to do. For instance, you learn that you're going to be starting a new subject. And that means more assignments. That means more tests. What is your initial reaction? Oh my God, this is not fair. Don't you realize we have families at home? Don't you realize we already have homework every single day and you're loading us up with another subject? So we have to see 
our immediate reactions, our initial reactions. How do we react? Look at the Sahaba. How was their reaction? مِن بَعْدِ مَا أَصَابَهُمُ الْقَرْحِ They were hurting much more than us. They were suffering much more than us. And what they were told to do was also much more difficult than we are told to do. What was their reaction and what is our reaction? We need to analyze ourselves. We need to analyze ourselves. الَّذِينَ قَالَ لَهُمُ النَّاسِ Those whom the people said, إِنَّ النَّاسَ قَدْ جَمَعُوا لَكُمْ Indeed, the people have gathered against you. فَخْشَوْهُمْ So fear them. فَزَادَهُمْ إِمَانًا But it increased them in faith. وَقَالُوا حَسْبُنَ اللَّهُ وَنِعْمَ الْوَكِيلِ And they said, Sufficient for us is Allah, and He is the best disposer of affairs. We learned that when the Muslims, as I mentioned to you earlier, when they went towards, when they went in pursuit of the Mushrik army, and they camped at Hamra al-Asad, what happened? A person from the Mushrik inside, he came and tried to scare the Muslims. That Abu Sufyan and his army, they are coming in order to attack you. So, الَّذِينَ قَالَ لَهُمُ النَّاسِ The people said to them. The people said to who? The Sahaba. Who does Anas over here refer to? Who said to them? Nuraim ibn Mas'ud al Ashjari. He said to them. It is also said that Anas over here refers to the hypocrites. Who does it refer to? The hypocrites. That when they saw the Muslims preparing for their second pursuit, when they saw the Muslims preparing to leave Medina again in order to pursue the Mushrik army, the hypocrites, they discouraged the Muslims, said, what are you doing? Why are you going there? You can't face the Mushrik army. You have just suffered a great defeat. You think you can go and face them? You cannot face them. So they said, in nasa indeed the people, who does the second Anas refer to? Abu Sufyan and his companions. The first Anas refers to who? The hypocrites, and in particular, Nu'aym al-Asjari. And the second Nas refers to Abu Sufyan and his army. So they said that indeed the people, قَدْ جَمَعُوا لَكُمْ They have gathered for you. Meaning, they have gathered themselves, they have come together in order to attack you. They have mustered up their forces to finish you, to completely eradicate you. فَخْشَوْهُمْ So fear them. But the thing is, if you just start fearing your enemy, is it going to help you? No. What benefit is fear going to bring you? Nothing. No benefit at all. So they said to them, فَخْشَوْهُمْ So fear them. And out of their fear, do not go in order to encounter them. But what does Allah say? What was the reaction of the Sahaba? فَزَادَهُمْ إِمَانًا But it increased them in Iman. What increased them in Iman? The saying of the people, this takhweef, that إِنَّ النَّاسَ قَدْ جَمَعُوا لَكُمْ This increased them in Iman. What was this Iman? What was this Iman that they increased in? Their belief in Allah, their belief in His help. So فَزَادَهُمْ إِمَانًا Because this is exactly what they were going out for. That they were pursuing. When they left Medina, they weren't sure about the fact that Abu Sufyan and his army were coming back. They didn't know about that. Halfway through, they found out that Abu Sufyan was coming. So they left out to do something. And they weren't sure if they were going to be able to do it. Halfway through, they find out they're definitely going to do it. Obviously, increase them in Iman. This is exactly what they were expecting. So, Fazadahum Imana. They became more determined. They became more convinced. They became more steadfast. وَقَالُوا And they said, حَسْبُنَ Allah, Sufficient for us is Allah. حَسْبُنَ Allah From the root letters, حَاسِينَ بَا That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sufficient for us. He is enough for us. Meaning He will fully take care of us. And He is sufficient for us against them. He is sufficient for us against the mushrik army. Our support is Allah. We are in His way. We responded to His call. And Hasbun Allah, Allah is sufficient for us. Just look at their positive thinking. They just suffered a loss. Just imagine if you suffer from something, if you suffer a loss, how do you feel? Abandoned, alone, betrayed. But what is their reaction? Hasbun Allah. Why? Because they knew that what they were doing was right. I am doing this for the sake of Allah. So Allah should be enough for me. Hasbun Allah. Wa ni'mal wakil. And how good is he as a wakil? Al wakil is from the root letters. Wa kaf lam. And wakil is one who is appointed in order to administer the affairs of 
someone. Because a person cannot take care of his affairs by himself. Nobody can take care of everything themselves. You always need the help of somebody or the other. For instance, if it's your money, if it's your banking, if it's your taxes, you need the help of somebody else. So, wakil is one who is appointed to administer the affairs of someone. So, wa ni'mal wakil, how excellent is he as a guardian, as a trustee, someone to rely upon, someone who is going to manage our affairs, someone to whom we are going to entrust our matter to. How excellent he is. Wa ni'mal wakil, how excellent a wakil he is. So, we see over here that the Sahaba, they did not get affected by the scare tactics that other people used against them. And sometimes this happens. People come and try to scare you. Are you sure you want to do this? It's quite difficult. 18 months, 30 jizz. Are you sure? Are you positive? Are you sure you can handle it? I couldn't. I know many people who couldn't. So, sometimes people come and they try to scare you. What was the reaction of the Sahaba? When people tried to scare them, فَزَادَهُمْ إِمَانًا It increased them in their iman. They were more sure that what they were doing was right. They were more determined about the fact that what they were doing was correct. It was the right thing to do. Because only the one who is doing something right faces opposition. Someone who is doing wrong, who cares about them? But someone who is doing right, he is excelling. He is going ahead of us. Oppose him. Don't let him go. And also we learned that shaitan, he is the one who comes and tries to incite other people against us. He tries to make other people come to us so that they come and scare us, they come and discourage us from going in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what are some of the lessons that we learn from this ayah? First of all, that during times of difficulty and hardship, the iman of the believer, what happens to it? It increases. At a time of difficulty and hardship, the iman of a believer, it increases. And on the other hand, the iman of a hypocrite, what happens to it? It decreases. In hardship, the iman of the believer increases. How? That when he is in difficulty, he is going to increase in his dua. He is going to increase in his ibadah, in his tawakkul. And all of these are what? They are a means of increasing your iman. Similarly, a believer is more confident about the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these times. And so he increases in his iman. His iman in the sifat of Allah. In the words of Allah. In the promises of Allah. And on the other hand, the hypocrite, because he thinks that he has to deal with everything himself. He doesn't think, Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil. What happens? His iman decreases. He loses hope in Allah. He loses confidence in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also we see that every hardship, every difficulty that a person goes through, any difficulty, what is it? It's a test. Every single difficulty that we go through in life is a test, whether it is something small or something big. The believer, what is his reaction at the loss of something? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. He knows that fabi idnillah, this is by the permission of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed it. He accepts that this is the decision of Allah and he, as a result, comes closer to Allah. And on the other hand, the hypocrite, he does not trust Allah and he despairs. So whenever we face any difficulty, we should see how are we reacting? How am I reacting? Do I get upset with Allah? Do I get upset with the people? Do I get upset with Allah? Do I get upset with people? Because sometimes this is what happens. Something goes wrong and we get frustrated with people. We show our anger to them. We, we think it's because of them that I can't do this. Who are people? They cannot affect you. They cannot change anything for you. They cannot change your decree at all. Something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has willed for you, you can never miss it. And whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not willed for you, you can never get it. People cannot interfere. So what's the point of getting angry at people? And also we see that at the time of difficulty, what should our response be? What should we say? حَسْبُنَ اللَّهُ وَنِعْمَ الْوَكِيلُ Allah is sufficient for us and He is the best trustee. Excellent trust he is. Any difficulty that you're in, whether it is a test that is coming up, or it is the shortage of time and too many things to do, any difficulty, any situation that you're in, what should you think? Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil. Hasbi Allah wa ni'mal wakil. Allah is sufficient for me and what an excellent wakil he is. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who has 
all might and power. If he's on your side, you have everything. We learned that the reaction of the believers at the battle of Ahzab was also very similar. In Surah Al-Ahzab, Ayah 22, we learn, وَلَمَّا رَأَى الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الْأَحْزَابَ قَالُوا هَذَا مَا وَعَدَنَا اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَصَدَقَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَمَا زَادَهُمْ إِلَّا إِيمَانًا وَتَسْلِيمًا And when the believers saw the companies, they said, this is what Allah and His Messenger had promised us. So when you see a difficulty in your way, what should you think? This is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised. You will surely definitely be tested. And Allah and His Messenger spoke the truth and it increased them only in faith and acceptance. Also we learned that Ibrahim alayhi salam, what did he say when he was being thrown into the fire? Hasbi Allah. We learned that from a hadith that is in Bukhari. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, when his son passed away, what was his reaction? What was his reaction? That he didn't complain, he didn't say anything negative, but he was crying. Because you do feel sad, you do feel hurt, you do feel the pain, but you shouldn't utter anything negative. And at that moment, statements such as inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un or hasbi Allahu wa ni'mal wakil, these statements should come out of our mouths. Because these show that a person has truly increased in his iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has increased in his confidence in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We learn from a hadith that a person who is in a state of fear, a khaif, one who is in a state of fear, for him, for every khaif, there is a man in this kalima. What does a man mean? That there is peace and security, a sense of security in saying this kalima. Because sometimes in a state of fear, what happens? We start crying and we start panicking and we start going here and there, running and picking up the phone and calling this person, calling that person. Huh? But what should we do? Yes, try to get the help. Try to do what you can do. But also try to get help from Allah. Because He is the one who can actually help you. It's possible you call someone and they don't pick up the phone. You pick up your phone and your phone doesn't work. It's possible it happens. Whose help do you need? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in any time of difficulty, especially in the state of fear, for every khaif, there is a man in this kalima. Also we learn from a hadith in Tabarani, that whoever says these words in a state of fear, meaning a person is afraid of something or afraid of a person, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relieves that person from the fear of that thing. So if you are in a state of fear and you say, Hasbi Allahu ni'mal wakil, with full iman, with full confidence, that Allah is enough for me, and He is my trustee. What an excellent trustee He is. So if a person says that, then what happens? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will relieve you of the fear that you're going through. He will take that fear away from you. And only when the fear is taken away from you, then can you do something. If you're overcome by fear, what can you do? You can't do anything. You can't think straight. You can't make correct decisions. Also we learn, Aisha radiallahu she said that when the Prophet ﷺ would be grieved, when he would be in a state of fear and in a state of sadness, he would read these words over and over again. He would read these words, Hasbunallah, Hasbiallah, Wani'mul Wakil. He would repeat this many times. So in some situations we feel alone, we feel very weak, we feel very incapable, we feel very exhausted, and we sometimes feel that we cannot go on. We cannot move any further. In these situations, instead of despairing, instead of fearing other people, instead of fearing the mountain of work in front of you, what should you say? Hasbunallahu wa ni'mal wakil. I am doing this for Allah. And only Allah will give me the tawfiq. Only Allah can enable me to do this. So Allah is enough for me. He will make me successful. What was the result? فَانْقَلَبُوا بِنِعْمَةٍ مِّنَ Allah. So they returned with favor from Allah. وَفَضْلٍ And also bounty. لَمْ يَمْسَسْهُمْ سُوءٌ No harm having touched them. وَاتَّبَعُوا رِضْوَانَ Allah, And they pursued the pleasure of Allah. وَاللَّهُ ذُو فَضْلٍ عَظِيمٌ And Allah is a possessor of great bounty. فَانْقَلَبُوا From the root letters, قَافْ لَمْبَ So they returned. From where? The Sahaba, they went in pursuit of the Mushrikeen army. And they camped at Hamra al-Asad, along with the Prophet ﷺ. Where they stayed for three days. And when the Mushrikeen 
when they did not come what happened they came back to medina they came back home so fan qalabu so they returned with what bi ni'matin min allah with the blessing of allah what was this blessing this blessing refers to afia security safety it also refers to ajr reward coming back home with honor with all of the people that went everybody came back home safely having iman they didn't lose their iman because sometimes when a person goes through a difficult situation he loses his iman but they came back home with the ni'ma of iman without any distress and they also came back with wa fadlin notice fadl has been mentioned so many times again and again because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives reward many times more multiplied you do one thing for him at least try sacrificing for him once and see the fadl see the extra favor what does a fadl refer to in this context it refers to more reward because they went out for what in order to combat the enemy but they didn't actually confront the enemy they came back home without having another battle without having another confrontation but when they came back home they got the ajr of a battle that they had participated in why because they made the niyyah and they actually did something to do that action so a fadl this was the extra favor that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them extra reward bonus so one reward they got ni'ma for having gone and the second fadl the extra reward was what that they got the reward without even fighting without even participating in the battle and also fadl refers to it boosted up their confidence the rejuvenation of their confidence of their iman of their morale and they also came back with profits because as i mentioned to you earlier that they came across a caravan and they ended up having some trade with them and they came back home with profit we learn from a hadith this is mentioned in bukhari that he who intends to do a good deed but he does not do it then allah records it for him as a full good deed why because he made the niya So this was the fadl that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewarded them even though they did not actually participate in the battle. Lam yamsasuhum su no evil touched them. Yamsasuhum is from the root letters mim sin sin mas. So no evil touched them meaning they did not suffer any more harm. No more wounds, no more killing. Nothing at all. And this thing about that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards a person for his niya even even though he is not able to actually do that action we learn from surah an-nisa ayah 100 wa may yakhruj min baytihi muhajiran ila allah wa rasulihi thumma yudrikhu al-mawt faqad waqa'a ajruhu ala allah and whoever leaves his home as an immigrant to allah and his messenger and then death overtakes him so for example a person decides that he's going to do hijrah So for instance imagine at the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam somebody leaves mecca and he's on his way to medina muhajiran ila allah wa rasulihi what happens thumma yudrikhu al maut but then death overtakes him he wasn't even able to get to medina he wasn't even able to get to his destination what does allah say faqad waqa'a ajruhu ala allah his reward has already become incumbent upon allah meaning allah will definitely reward him why because he made the niya and he started the journey Sometimes we only make the intention and we don't even start the project. We don't even start doing something. Over here we see that the person made the niya and he also started preparing for it. He started doing something. But he wasn't able to accomplish it. So, he will get rewarded for it. Also we learned the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said this is a hadith which is mentioned in Bukhari that if a servant of Allah falls ill or goes on a journey, he continues to be rewarded for the good deeds that he used to do. when he was healthy or he was at home so for instance you have a habit of reciting surah al-mulk every night before going to sleep but let's say you are very sick and you sleep early and you weren't able to recite surah al-mulk or you have a really bad headache and you're not able to recite surah al-mulk and you wish you could do it you want to do it but you're not able to so even though you haven't still Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards the person. Why? Because if he was able to do it, he would have done it. It was his sickness. 
it was his inability that prevented him. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows about that person. Similarly, if a person is traveling and he's not able to perform the regular ibadat that he would at home. So even in that case, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards the person. So, for example, I mentioned to you about a person who recites Surah Al-Mulk every night. Similarly, there is a person who strives to gain knowledge of the deen, knowledge of the Qur'an and Sunnah. And then he dies. He's not able to learn what he intended to learn. He's not able to achieve what he aimed, what he intended to achieve. But he will be resurrected among the scholars on the Day of Judgment. Why? Because if he were to live longer, then he would have reached that level. But because he died, and therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward him. What does this show to us? Sometimes we say, oh, I'm so old now. I've lost my young age, my youth. It's too late for me. I cannot memorize the Qur'an now. I cannot try to understand the Qur'an now. It's not possible. You do this when you're young and when you're healthy, when you have time. I don't have time anymore. But we see that if a person, no matter when he starts, it's his niya, it's his goal, and he wishes to do it, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will resurrect him amongst his scholars in the day of resurrection. I remember in Pakistan, there was a lady and she was 80 years old when she joined the course. She was 80. She was the oldest student. And alhamdulillah, she completed the course. And after completing that course, she didn't then go home and just sit there. No, she joined the advanced course. And she passed away during that course. We think it's too late. We think we can't do it anymore. We don't have enough time left. I've passed my teens. I've passed my twenties. It's too late for me. It's never too late. Just start. Just start doing it. As long as you have the niya, you have the goal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you for the goal even if you don't attain that goal. Even if you don't achieve that goal, just start. Allah knows your niya. And sometimes we think, for instance, we go to the masjid and we pray to nafil. And you think, oh, okay, Jamal is going to start any time now, so let me just sit and wait. Why wait? Sometimes if you start another two rakah, it's possible that you go till the end and then the Jamal starts. Why just spend that time sitting and doing nothing? Either do dhikr or pray to sunnah, pray to nafil. Don't think it's too late. Sometimes you think it's too late and then we leave it. But do it anyway because Allah will reward you. Similarly, there's a person who goes for hajj and he dies there. He will be resurrected in what state? When he will be reciting the talbiyah. So over here we learn that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewarded the companions with ni'mah as well as fadl, extra favor. And what is that fadl? That he gave them the reward for participating in a battle although they did not participate. وَاتَّبَعُوا رِضْوَانَ Allah, And they pursued the pleasure of Allah. They pursued the pleasure of Allah. Meaning, why did they go out of their homes in the state of wounds and in the state of fatigue? Why? In order to get the pleasure of Allah. How? By obeying Allah and by obeying the Messenger. Wallahu ذُو fadlin azim, And Allah is possessor of great bounty. Allah is possessor of great bounty. What does it mean by this? Allah has great fadl. Meaning He can give a lot. Just do something so you can get some fadl. Just do something. He can give a lot. He has abundant treasures, limitless treasures. You do something so that you can get some reward. Allah bestows a lot of fadl to the people. Recitation. Al-Ladheena Stajaim Wattaba'u ridwan Allah That they pursued the pleasure of Allah. Why did they leave their homes? Why? To get the pleasure of Allah. So they made the niyyah, they made the resolve, despite their weakness, despite their wounds, despite their injuries, despite their fatigue. Why? To get the pleasure of Allah. And notice Ridwan has been mentioned. Because when a person does something good, in this state especially, when he is suffering, when he is hurting, then automatically he has high hopes of reward. So وَاتَّبَعُوا رِضْوَانَ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ ذُو فَضْلٍ عَظِيمٍ And Allah is possessor of great fadl for those who obey Him. For those who try to get his ridwan, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows them with his ridwan as well. إِنَّمَا ذَلِكُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ يُخَوِّفُ أَوْلِيَاءَهُ That is only shaytan who frightens you of his supporters. فَلَا تَخَافُوهُمْ وَخَافُونِ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ So fear them not, 
but fear me if you are indeed believers innama dhalikum dhalikum dhalika ism ishara and the kum over here refers to those who are being addressed meaning the companions so indeed dhalikum that was who was the person who came to you telling you that inna an-nasa qad jama'u lakum fakhshawhum who was he nu'aym ibn mas'ud al-ashjari so that was actually who that was actually a shaytan doesn't mean that nu'aym al-ashjari was actually shaytan what it means is that shaytan is the one who provoked him who enticed him to come to you and say such discouraging statements to you what nuaim did was a fear of shaitan it was an action of shaitan because shaitan what does he do he discourages us from going out in the way of allah from obeying allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's what shaitan does and he encourages us to disobey allah sometimes he whispers to us directly and sometimes he comes to us through people alladhi yuwaswisu fi sudur an-nas So he comes and gives waswasa, puts waswasa in your heart and sometimes he goes and puts waswasa in the heart of other people so that they come and discourage you. They come and tell you. Because sometimes, you know when you're feeling in your heart, maybe I shouldn't do this. And if somebody else comes and tells you, don't do this, then you're like, okay, maybe I really shouldn't do it. Because you yourself have the feeling and somebody else is also telling you, although it's the wrong thing to do. So, Sometimes shaitan he puts waswasa in our hearts and he also comes to us through other people. So what does Allah say? Inna ma dhalikum ash-shaytan it was actually shaitan yukhawifu awliya'ahu. He was frightening you from his close friends. Yukhawifu from khawafa takhwif it is to frighten someone to scare someone to arouse fear in them. So yukhawifu awliya'ahu. Now the word yukhawifu it needs to it requires two objects. it requires two objects what does it mean by that that you khawifu he was frightening who who was he frightening the first object you o muslims that's not mentioned here now the second object who was he frightening you from his close friends that is mentioned over here so you khawifu awliya'ahu what this means is you khawifu kum awliya'ahu he was frightening you from his close friends who are the awliya of shaitan the mushrikeen army walladhina kafaru awliya'uhum at-taghut so yukhawifu awliya'uhu he was trying to scare you frighten you from his friends the army of the kuffar the disbelievers and remember every disobedient person everyone who disobeys allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he is who the wali of shaitan he is a friend of shaitan because he is befriending shaitan instead of befriending allah by obeying allah who are we befriending allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and by disobeying him who are we listening to shaitan obviously then we're befriending shaitan so awliya'uhu the awliya of shaitan yes in the context it does refer to the mushrikeen army but otherwise we can also understand this as those people who disobey allah what does allah say fala takhafuhum so you should not fear them don't fear them don't fear who the awliya of shaitan that no matter how great their numbers may seem No matter how small you appear to yourself still don't fear them why because shaitan is telling you to fear them and shaitan is your enemy shaitan is a big liar so don't listen to him fala takhafuhum don't fear them wa khafuni and fear me instead fear who fear allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instead what does it mean by this that fear leaving my command fear abandoning my command In difficult situations, in difficult times, what happens? On one side, we are being called to the command of Allah. And on the other side, we are being called to disobedience to Allah. And sometimes, it's the fear of people. What are they going to say? What are they going to think? It's the fear of people that stops us from obeying Allah. And it takes us to disobeying Allah. What does Allah say? Those people are who? The friends of shaitan. those people who listen to shaitan and you don't want to listen to shaitan because then you will also become a friend of shaitan don't fear them and instead who should you fear allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in kuntum mu'minin if you're truly believers 
If you're truly believers, then you must fear only Allah and not the people, not the awliya of shaitan. So we see that over here, the believers are being told, don't fear the enemy, don't fear the awliya of shaitan, rather you should fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at the time of difficulty, what should be the reaction of a true believer? That has be Allah. Allah is enough for me. Wanirman wakil. What an excellent supporter. What an excellent trustee he is. So why should you fear the enemy? We see that fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is actually a part of iman. Over here Allah says, وَخَافُونِي Fear me. It's a command. In kuntum mu'mineen. If you're truly believers. What does this show? That fearing Allah is a part of iman. When a person fears Allah more, then the fear of people, it subsides. It reduces. So for instance, you are in a group of people and you are being encouraged to do something wrong. If you don't listen to what the people are telling you to do, you fear that they're going to say something bad to you. And on the other hand, you have the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you increase in the fear of Allah, that over here, okay, there are only 10 people here today. There are only a thousand people here today. But on the Day of Judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to ask me. وَشَاهِدٍ mashhud. The day when my actions are going to be displayed in front of everybody. وَشَاهِدٍ mashhud. People are going to witness. Do I want them to see this? No. So when a person fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more, the hisab, the Day of Judgment, the accounting, then automatically the fear of people is going to reduce. The fear of people is going to subside. But it's only going to be when a person fears Allah more. So, fearing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a part of iman. And also we see that if a person has less fear of Allah, then he will have more fear of people. I cannot bear the comments of other people. I'm scared of them. And sometimes you see that you're doing something right, but you feel so nervous. For instance, if you're praying salah in a public place, Sometimes you're doing the right thing, but you feel so nervous. Oh my God, what are they going to say? What are they going to say? Don't think like that. Fear Allah. Allah has commanded you to pray five times a day at the proper time. Don't fear what people are going to say. Fear the hisab. Fear the accounting on the day of judgment. And automatically, if you have more fear of Allah, then the fear of people is going to reduce. But if you have more fear of people, then you will not be able to fear Allah. If you have more fear of people, then you will not be able to fear Allah. How can a person reduce in his fear of people? How? By fearing Allah. How else? By thinking that people cannot actually harm me. Hasbi Allah. Allah is enough for me. By telling yourself that people cannot actually harm me. And how much can they really do? Okay, they will say one harsh statement, one rude statement, and that's it. What else can they do? What more can they do? They can't do a lot. They can't harm you more. So this is what brings confidence to a person. We see that there are three types of khawf. There are three types of khawf. First of all, khawful ibadah. Khawful ibadah. And what is that? It is a fear that is part of ibadah. And it is exclusively for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for instance, the time of salah comes. And a person out of the fear of Allah, what does he do? What does he do? He performs a salah. Similarly, a person is in a situation where he could possibly lie. But out of the fear of Allah, he does not lie. Out of the fear of Allah, he fasts. Out of the fear of Allah, he does what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded him to do. And this fear is only, it is exclusively for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for instance, if a person, he starts fearing the dead, or like the saints, that if I don't go to their grave, then something evil is going to happen. This is what? Khawful ibadah. But this is not appropriate except only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly, a person thinks that if I don't sacrifice for the sake of this saint, or for the sake of this angel, then what's going to happen? I'm going to suffer some harm. This is what? Khawful ibadah. And it is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if a person fears an angel or fears a demon or fears a dead person or fears, you know, a saint, then this is not correct. Khawf al-ibadah is exclusively for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second type of fear is khawf al-tabi'i. Tabi'i. 
خوفت طبيعي from طا با عين and this is natural fear طا با يا عين يا this is natural fear so for instance a person is scared of snakes a person is scared of fire this is what? natural fear and this kind of fear is harmless as long as it does not hinder a person from obeying Allah or it does not take a person to doing haram it is okay as long as it does not take a person to disobeying Allah in any way for instance we learn that Musa a.s. when he killed a man by mistake we learn in the Quran فَأَصْبَحَ فِي الْمَدِينَةِ خَائِفًا يَتَرَقَّ in the morning he went about how خَائِفًا fearful يَتَرَقَّ he was watching out also we learn that Musa a.s. was told خُذْهَا وَلَا تَخَفْ hold take the snake and don't fear why? because he was experiencing fear that was natural so this natural fear is okay as long as it does not take a person to disobeying Allah in any way the third type of fear is خَوْفُ الْجُبَنَا جُبَنَا جِيم بَا نُون أَلِفْ هَمْزَ with a fatha on the ba and a dhamma on the jim جُبَنَا and this is cowardliness this is when a person is fearful of every single thing he is a coward and he does not have the strength he does not have the confidence to face anything so for instance if he has to say something to someone like I'm scared I can't say it I'm too shy Similarly, a person does not want to take any risks. I'm not going to go up the elevator because what if it stops halfway through? So this kind of fear is what? It makes a person a coward. And this type of fear does not let a person do anything. Which is why this is something that is disliked. And if a person is experiencing this, he should try to get rid of this kind of fear. We can understand this as phobias. Because sometimes, because of some phobia, a person is not able to do even the right thing. And he's panicking unnecessarily. So he should try to overcome this kind of fear because it will prevent him from accomplishing things in life, from being successful in life, from taking risks. Because if you don't take risks, then you cannot do much. And we see that a believer, he may experience this fear at some points only. He may experience this fear very rarely, occasionally. So for instance, the Sahaba, they experienced this at the Battle of Uhud which is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down upon them, Nu'asan as amana. Why? Because they were in a state of fear. They were in a state of panic. They didn't know what was going on. And some of them, because of that fear, they had given up fighting. When they heard that the Prophet sallallahu had been killed, they gave up fighting. They stopped right there. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent upon them, Nu'as as amana. So we see that this type of fear, khawful jubana, this is something that is discouraged. And a person should try to overcome this somehow or the other. He must try to overcome this somehow or the other. It may be difficult for him, but he should try. And one of the best ways of overcoming this type of fear is by doing dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By reading more Quran. By remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more and more. Because Iman gives you confidence. Iman increases your trust. It increases your tawakkul. And then you know that, okay, if I see a spider on the wall, 10 feet away from me, it's not going to harm me. But with some people, just the sight of a spider, it scares them. Yes, okay, they can say it's natural, they don't have any control over it, but they must try to overcome it. Because it's possible that because of that poor spider, they start screaming, or they don't go into that room, and they don't do what is required of them. So this type of fear is definitely discouraged. So the three types of fear are what? خوف العبادة خوف الطبيعي and thirdly خوف الجبناء خوف العبادة this is something that we must have which is why Allah says وخاف we see that there are two motivational forces there are two feelings that motivate you one is fear and the other is love and these two they make you overcome yourself they make you overcome your weakness. They make you overcome your inability. They make you overcome your lack of resources. Fear and love. So we see that the Sahaba, they had fear. وَخَافُونِ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ And they also had love. وَاتَّبَعُوا رِضْوَانَ اللَّهِ They pursued the pleasure of Allah. Out of love for Allah. 
So for instance, if a person has fear of jinn, that's khawf tabi'i. But again, it should not become khawf al-jubana. It should not make you a coward, that you don't have the guts to say anything. You can't sleep alone. You can't sleep with the lights off. And we see that sahaba, they went out again the very next day after Uhud. Why? To get the pleasure of Allah. Despite the fact that they were suffering from wounds, they were emotionally very hurt as well. But still, they went out. And we see that sometimes we also may be in a situation where we're physically hurting. Emotionally, we may be hurting. We may be very sad. We may be very depressed or maybe we're very happy. But we think that if we're very happy or if we're very sad, then we have the excuse, we have the reason to stay behind. That's what we think. That if there's been a birth in the family, some relatives have come, or somebody is sick, okay, if they are dependent on you, then yes, you should stay, okay. However, if they're not dependent on you, then just because you want to be there and see all the fun that's going on, because of that, you miss or you leave that which is important, which you have committed to, that's not appropriate. And physical strength is important, but internal strength is much more important. So we learn from the hadith that al-mu'min al-qawi, the strong believer, is better than the weak believer. And in both there is goodness. Who is a strong believer? The one who is physically strong? The one who is strong in his iman? Because internal strength makes you overcome your physical weakness. It makes you overcome that. So what is needed is the strength of the heart, the resolve, azm, determination, that when you've made up your mind to do something, then you do it. And if we see over here, فَزَّادَهُمْ imana, It increased them in iman. We always think that the Sahaba, they had more iman than us, which is why they did much more than us. Yes, that is true. But there are ways of increasing your iman. If you don't even face the challenge, then how are you going to increase in your iman? If you go and face the challenge, then you're going to increase in your determination. Then you're going to increase your iman. And then you will be able to do something much better that requires more effort from you. And fear is a good thing because it motivates you. But again, it has to be the correct type of fear and fear has to be channelized. Over here we see that the people, they were fearing the enemy, the Sahaba, they were fearing Anas. But what were they told? لا تخافوهم خافوني Channel your fear. Don't direct all of your fear to them, meaning don't be fearful of them only, but rather fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. Similarly, if we just stay behind, if we don't take up the challenge, if we say I'm sick today and I'm ill, Tomorrow and I have a headache and I have an appointment and I have this and I have that and we keep staying behind from doing what we're supposed to then how can we set good examples for other people? How can we? Children at home, they get affected by what you do. They see that mom is going to school one day and she doesn't go another day. That sometimes she listens online and half the lesson she doesn't listen to. They are taking influence. Sometimes she does her homework, sometimes she doesn't. So we are also setting examples for other people by the way that we do our work. And وَأَتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا All together We see that the Sahaba, all of them They said حَسْبُنَ اللَّهُ وَنِعْمُ الْوَكِيلِ And sometimes we see that if one person is struggling Despite the difficulties that they're facing You get motivated That if they can do it, I can do it If they can do it, I can do it If she's trying Alhamdulillah, I don't have to try as hard But at least, you know, other people They serve as a motivation for you So be good examples for each other by encouraging each other by encouraging each other to keep going on and not stay behind we listen to the recitation of all of these ayats from the beginning 